reporter who spent quite a bit of time in Hitler Germany and who wrote a diary which had the good fortune to be read widely by a great many Americans, I've been asked by the Army-Navy Screen Magazine to talk about the film you're going to see. Well, the film is concerned with the Nazi youth movement. That is, it's about what Hitler has been able to do with the young people of Germany during the 12 years he's been in power. It's also enemy film, captured on the Western Front only a very short time ago. Perhaps that's one of the remarkable things about these pictures. They're so terribly recent. This is not a film of five years ago, or even of two years ago. To be precise, this is training film photographed in the winter of 1944 and 45, when, by all ordinary standards, the Germans should be ready to quit. Germany cannot be defeated, their set faces say. Let the very old doubt. Let the seriously wounded and the mortally ill believe all is lost, but not they, the young people. They, the young, will not betray the sacred trust put in them by der Führer. They will still carry their banners high. And where, we ask, does this strength come from? Why are they so confident? Where does it begin? Here's where. And here, in this crib, or in a carriage where a baby lies, his mind like a fresh tablet, white and unruled. Anything can be written on that tablet, as the Nazis well know. So they begin their education for hate and death, war and conquest, by taking the child from his parents and turning him over to the Boon der Deutscher Mädchen, a young girls' organization with over a million members, already dedicated to the principles of Nazism. We will not permit them to lapse into the old way of thinking Hitler has said of the children in these carriages. Instead, we will make them state children, and we will raise them according to plan. In Hitler, Germany, when a child is able to walk, he's also able to march and to carry a flag. I saw many such demonstrations as these during my years in Berlin, and still they go on. Children who learned to say gun, grenade, and stuka at an age when you and I were learning the meaning of words like cat, rat, and bat. And instead of playing with dolls, they're taught to make helmets. Who uses a helmet? A football player, yes, but also a tank man. Here again in this group of Jugend, as they're called, we get the meaning of total war. Here in these children, now a little older and proudly exhibiting their swastikas, we see what the Nazis mean when they say that every member of the new generation must be brought under the spell of National Socialism. Today we know from the Nazis' loud boasts that there is no schoolboy, no apprentice working in the trade, whether a girl or a boy, who is not a member of some Nazi youth organization. In fact, such membership is compulsory, just as every young person is forced to dedicate himself to Hitler and the divine mission that Germany will one day rule the world. No, the young mind of the German child is no longer fresh and unruled. Hitler and the Nazis have delibly black and deep with ideas we know belong to the dark ages, racial superiority, religious intolerance, and no respect for the rights of any people other than German. On the German report card, the word behavior has been changed to obedience. And here we see a group of Hitler youth being rewarded for their obedience and for the things they've learned, for knowing 141 experiments in gas and their antidotes, for knowing how to shoot, not only a rifle, but a machine gun. At the same time, they're taken on strength through joy tours and shown German monuments. Much time is spent on Frederick the Great, 
for he too once had the combined strength of Europe against him. But his enemies failed to remain united, and Frederick the Great emerged triumphant. And these German children are made to believe that the same thing will again happen in this war, that the English and the Americans hate each other, and that they have a common enemy in Russia. Every nation knows that its future resides in its youth, but no nation has known it better than Germany under Hitler, and none has worked harder with the ice. And that's why, after five years of war, after Germany's cities have been bombed mercilessly and six million of her soldiers lie dead, the youth of Germany still wish to serve Hitler and eagerly accept jobs aboard submarines as helpers. Nothing would excite and please these young Nazis more than to venture into hostile waters on such a ship and sink important Allied shipping. This is General Guderian, a German hero to whom Hitler has given great power. We can understand the importance of young people in the minds of the Nazis when we realize that these personal appearances are part of a German general's daily routine. Guderian must not only match his military skill against men like General Eisenhower and Marshal Zukov, but he must be ready at all times to impress upon the youth of Germany that Hitler is counting as much upon them as he is upon his armies. In the past, some have made the mistake of comparing various Nazi youth organizations with our own Boy Scouts and our YMCA. It's a bad comparison. This group of kids is not figuring out how to perform a good deed every day. They're not interested in helping a blind man cross the street or carrying an old woman's packages. This is war. These children know it, and they want more of it. Now we can begin to see why the German boy is so confident and why, when he learns the war is now being fought on sacred German soil, he is eager to volunteer for a labor battalion, eager to march off to dig the necessary tank traps, and defense ditches. On the Western Front, we've captured boys like this. Because they are boys, we have not believed they were dangerous or a threat to our military operations. Only gradually, and at a cost to American lives have we learned that they are fanatical Nazis ready to spy and sabotage. Some we have executed and others we have sent to prison for life. Now they furrow all Germany with fortifications, but when the time comes, they're ready to stand behind them with the guns and machine guns they've learned to use so skillfully and efficiently. Here, in an unidentified German city, the Hitler Youth of 18 is welcomed into the Wehrmacht, but the welcome is merely a formality, for there has been no real transformation from civilian life to army life, as there has been in our own country, in England and in Russia. These men have never known the pleasures of a home, of a family, of going to church on Sunday, and of having a sweetheart that one day they plan to marry. The entire life of these men has been in a Hitler uniform. Hitler's orders, stated clearly in Mein Kampf, have been obeyed. This is the German citizen of the next 25 years. This is the man who will still be a threat to any permanent peace when the guns have ceased firing. And it's because of them that the occupation of Germany is going to be one of our most difficult problems. These men are tough. We are going to have to be that much tougher. If Americans don't want to be back in uniform in another 10 years, fighting Germany all over again.
Army-Navy Screen Magazine has been getting so many requests lately from Navy men that this time we've asked Specialist Third Class Sullivan to take over. Our first request comes from Gunner's Mate Second Class, John Ellsworth, now in South Pacific waters. He'd like to see some pictures of the one-man torpedo that the German Navy's been using. As the drawing indicates, the weapon is two standard 21-inch German torpedoes secured together. The lower one is complete with warhead, while the upper one, in place of the warhead, has a control room with a plexiglass hatch in the nose, which is for the pilot. And here's an actual glimpse of the one-man torpedo taken from captured enemy film. The crew gives the craft a final check just before it goes into action. Because it cannot travel more than 100 miles under its own power, a mothership, under cover of darkness, must bring it within range of the target, important allied shipping in the North Sea. Here we can see only the control torpedo, but underneath is its explosive counterpart. Once aimed, the lower torpedo is released and goes forward under its own propulsion. The Germans score a hit. In the meantime, signals are flashed aboard the mothership, and a sharp lookout is kept for the pilot now afloat in the control torpedo. He will make for the ship or head for shore. As the last of their navy is knocked out or forced into hiding, the Nazis are trying to dramatize the importance of the one-man torpedo. But so far, this brainchild has been unable to effectively cripple our shipping. So far, it's merely one more proof the Nazis are determined to use every idea, every method in their rag bag of tricks to fight this war to the bitter end. We've had dozens of letters from Brooklyn boys, Navy and Army. All of them are convinced that by request would give them and the rest of the men in the service the biggest break of the war if we just show some shots of their very special hometown. Okay, Mac, here we go. A quick tour of Brooklyn, beginning with the famous bridge, looking at it from Lower Manhattan, then into the downtown district. Several requests came in for this shot of Fulton Street, so here it is. This shot of Henry Street is for Vincent Guarantiano, somewhere in France. When these three sailors reached home on leave, they didn't waste any time. All Brooklyn girls, of course. All right, boys, now we'll have the kiss. Thank you. To most men in service, Brooklyn is merely a convenient word on which to hang a gag. But not to Brooklynites born and bred there. To them, it's a good place to visit and a fine place to live. They think of it not only as a city divorced from the rest of New York, but as a move spirit with places like Prospect Park where there's snow on the ground long after it's melted everywhere else. These particular pictures of Lookout Mountain were taken for James Mannix, Bill Walsh and Sam Beanland, all seamen aboard the USS Adonis. And Corporal John Meyer out of the States now for over two years reminds us that Brooklyn is sometimes called the city of churches. It asks to see St. Teresa's, his parish church. Says it'd give him and 2,500 other Teresians in the service a lot of pleasure. And here's a shot of Shore Road for Sergeant Lester Rodney and several others who wrote in saying a glimpse of it and the bay would help take care of that homesick feeling. Now, everyone knows that a tree grows in Brooklyn, so naturally we had to include it. But Sergeant Applebaum thinks we should show a picture of Easton Parkway just to prove that more than one tree grows there. No pictures of Brooklyn would be complete without a glimpse of the stadium at Ebbets Field and them lovely bums in action. Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch, 
erected in honor of some other Brooklyn boys who went off to fight an important war in 1861. Sanford Smith, a seaman first class in the United States Coast Guard, writes that he's seen magazine pictures of Lena Romay, but has never heard her sing. How's chances, he asks, of seeing her on the screen? The chances are very good, seaman first class Smith. Here she is. Chiu, 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 chiu. Chiu, 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 chiu. Mira que la vida es triste, que tu cantar me alegra el corazón. Chiu, 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 chiu. Chiu, 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 chiu. Canta, canta, pajarito, que tu cantar me alegra el corazón. Con tus gorjeos, con tu trinar, despierta el alba la noche, ya se va. Con tus gorjeos, con tu trinar, despierta el alba la noche, ya se va. My heart singing just for two. Chew, 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 chew. This is the song I sang last night to you. Chew, 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 chew. Means my heart is on the wing. Chew, 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 chew. And when you're near, I hear an angel sing. My love is soaring, I'm flying high. You're so adoring, my heart is in the sky. The bird that's singing will soon be through. Then I'll be winging my song of love to you. There it is for this time, fellas. Keep the letters coming, and we'll keep trying to answer them. Remember the address? By request department, Army, Navy, Screen Magazine, New York City. <laughs>